When we get an infection, it is caused by parasites, a fungus, bacteria or viruses. These organisms are not able to infect our bodies unless our immune system is weakened or compromised. In session 3, I explained how a thought life dominated by fear, anxiety and stress will result in high levels of the stress hormone cortisol in the blood. In large quantities, cortisol kills the cells of the immune system. The consequence is that you are now vulnerable to infections because your immune system is weakened. Bacteria, fungus and parasites that infect the human body and cause disease are living organisms. They are able to reproduce and they are able to survive on their own. They are basically like little animals. But there is something very different about a virus. A virus does not have an original life form of its own. That is an important point and you'll see why later. On the screen is a simplified picture of what a virus basically is. It, it has a coat or a protein capsule and that coat was never originally the virus's. It was derived from the membrane of another cell that it previously infected. Inside the coat is a piece of defect, defective genetic material which is DNA. The piece of genetic material or DNA was also not originally the viruses. It was also derived from another cell that that virus previously infected. So a virus does not have an original life form of its own. The second characteristic of a virus is that it is not able to live and survive on its own. It is only able to live and reproduce by using the biochemical machinery and structural material of other cells that it infects, such as the cells of the human body. The third characteristic of a virus is that it continually changes its genetic material and also its appearance by taking pieces of the body cell's genetic material and membrane as it moves from one body cell to the next. Viruses also exchange genetic material with each other. Also, when the genetic material of a virus is being replicated inside a body cell, in other words, when the virus is reproducing to make more viruses, lots of errors are made while putting the genetic material together to make up that virus. And this also contributes to the change in the virus's genetic material and appearance. Because the viruses are continually changing, they are often able to evade detection by their body's immune system. This can be compared to a policeman who is trying to catch a thief in the crowd while the thief is continually changing his appearance. It is nearly impossible. There are no medical drugs that have ever been invented that have ever been able to cure a virus. One of the reasons is because the virus is continually changing. A prime example of this is the HIV virus. There are millions of different strains of HIV viruses that are made daily. The HIV viruses within an individual exchange genetic material with each other. And when the person has sexual intercourse with another HIV infected person, the HIV viruses from the two different people will also exchange genetic material with each other. This enables the viruses to adapt and to become resistant to the medical drugs that the person is taking to kill the viruses. If I was to take a sample of blood from an HIV infected person and study that virus,
it would take about two or three years to invent a drug to kill that virus. But by the time the drug is invented, it is already obsolete because the very next day after the sample was taken, there are millions of new HIV viruses with a totally, that are totally different to the virus that I studied to make the drug. Doctors can come up with any medical drug they like in, a, in an attempt to kill the HIV virus or any other virus. But it is like the virus sees the medication before it even enters our bodies. It is like it has eyes because it takes its present genetic material and it mixes it with some of the genetic material of the cells it infects and it remanufactures itself into a different strain of the virus that is resistant to that drug. Henry Wright made a statement about viruses. He said there is an intelligence behind viruses that defies imagination. A virus is an aberration of a genetic life form that seems to have a mind of its own. Viruses will sometimes go and hide in the nerve roots and they remain dormant for years and then reactivate causing the disease to flare up again. Even the medical community has the most astounding definition of a virus. Viruses are an alien genetic life force. The genetic code material that the virus is made up of does not think. But behind viruses is an invisible being that thinks. Behind viruses there is a type of intelligence and it is not of God. There's something alien that is an intelligent, invisible being that afflicts man's flesh with a highly calculated, destructive mission. I have begun to realize that viruses are the spirits of infirmity in the tissue that the Bible talks about in Luke chapter 13. There is no medical drug that has ever been invented that has been able to kill a virus because we are trying to kill something that is already dead. You cannot kill a virus, you cannot destroy it, but you can divert it. That is through repentance of sin and by casting out the evil spirit. Henry Wright has been attacking viruses from this basis and people have been healed from incurable diseases that are virally related. I explained earlier that viruses do not have an original life form of their own and they also cannot survive on their own outside of the human body. This is significant because according to the Bible the devil and his demonic spirits need a body to work and express themselves through. For example in Mark chapter 5 when Jesus cast out evil spirits out of a man they begged Jesus to allow them to go into, her, into a herd of pigs that were nearby. We read this in Mark 5 verse 11 to 12. And the demons begged him saying, Send us into the hogs, that we may go into them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out of the man and entered into the hogs. And the herd numbering about 2,000 rushed headlong down the steep slope into the sea and were drowned in the sea. When an evil spirit is cast out, it wanders around seeking a place of rest. It is seeking a place of rest because it is in torment. It has every urge of its fallen nature, but it has no way to express itself. When it was in the human, it was at peace, and the human was in torment. When it is cast out, the human is at peace, and the spirit is in torment because it has no place to fulfill its fallen nature and creation. This information that I am sharing with you in this session will probably never be documented or accepted in the medical field, but I can only speak from my own experience, the experience of other doctors who are applying these principles, and the experience of others in ministry such as Henry Wright. When a disease is incurable in the medical field, and we don't understand what causes it or how to treat it, I have learned to go to the Bible to look for the answer. This is because I am seeing the Bible prove medical science and vice versa, medical science proving the Bible. We are a people of God who are in bondage and God's people are being sent to the world for help when the answers are waiting right here in His Word to set you free. We must never forget the models in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and the book of Acts which show us the way that Jesus ministered. 
There are accounts in the Bible of Jesus of Jesus first casting out an evil spirit before administering healing and miracles to the body that was damaged by the spirit. There are some diseases where deliverance is necessary for healing to take place. The diseases that I am going to talk about in session 15 and 16 are the fruit of an evil spirit and you will not get healed unless you cast out the evil spirit. You say an evil spirit can be behind a disease? Oh, read your Bible. Why don't we believe it today? Because we've been so mesmerized by science. If it weren't for the testimonies of so many people who have been healed or permanently cured through deliverance, you would think that I have a screw loose. But the experience speaks for itself. When the evil spirits are cast out in the name of Jesus, people have been instantly healed from the diseases I'm about to talk about. And I'll be sharing testimonies with you as we go along. Often in the church, people get all agitated and, and uneasy when you start using the term evil spirit or demon. But we have no need to be fearful about this subject. The devil and his kingdom are not greater than God and Jesus has given us full authority over the devil and his demons. I've spoken about the misunderstanding of possession twice previously, but I'll mention it one more time. There is a big debate in the church about whether or not a Christian can have an evil spirit. The issue is not so much about possession, it's about servitude to sin. The evil spirit could be outside, inside, or on Mars with a megaphone. The point is you've been listening to it by walking in disobedience and sin. Being born again does not make you immune to evil spirits. Walking in obedience does. I am certainly seeing evidence in the medical field that born again Christians can have disease that is the direct work and fruit of an evil spirit. In session 11 and 12, I spoke about the spirit-mind-body connection. Everybody knows about the mind-body connection. Science has proven that the mind-body connection is real and what we think affects our whole body. But not everybody knows about the spiritual dimension of our lives. The Bible says that we are a spirit and we have a soul and we live in a body. So we are a triune being. The medical field is at a major disadvantage when it comes to healing because they only consider the soul and body and do not acknowledge the other third of our being which is spiritual. Therefore the medical field is never going to get anywhere beyond simple disease management with the diseases that I'm going to talk about in these next two sessions because you need deliverance, not medication. I'd like to discuss epilepsy, autism, ADHD, dyslexia, color blindness and homosexuality. These are a group of diseases that can be inherited and which run together in family trees. When you find ADHD in children, you'll also find it in the parents and grandparents. It's the same way with epilepsy and dyslexia. Psychologists and psychiatrists have documented that children with epilepsy also frequently have ADHD. Where there is ADHD in a family tree, you also often find epilepsy, dyslexia and color blindness in the different generations. I have repeatedly seen this for myself. These diseases are all different manifestations of the same underlying problem, which is an interruption in neurological flow and a breakdown in perception in the brain. Remember in session 2 I explained that your thoughts are physically in your brain in the form of electrical current that travels along the nerves. A child with ADHD is not able to concentrate on one thing for a long time because its thoughts or the neurological flow in its brain is suddenly interrupted, causing the child to lose focus. That is why if you look at a child with ADHD's bedroom, you will see a trail of six piles of different games where it was playing. This is because the child keeps losing focus and moving on to the next thing without finishing anything that it starts. Because children with ADHD cannot focus for long, they are a nightmare in the classroom at school. A person with epilepsy has a tendency to have recurrent seizures, which are also called convulsions or fits. 
Just like ADHD, there is an interruption in neurological flow, leading to, leading to an imbalance in the electrical activity in the brain. Your brain is divided up into different areas. Each area is responsible for a different function of your body. For example, there is an area in your brain that controls speech. There's another area that controls the movement of the muscles in your legs. Another area controls the movement in your arms and so on. The communication between your brain and body occurs via electrical impulses that travel along the nerves. And when an electrical impulse that travels from your brain to your muscles, the electrical impulse will shock the muscles and cause it to contract. The contraction of the muscles is what produces movement. In epilepsy, the imbalance in electrical activity causes an abnormal electrical discharge that spreads throughout the brain. So many areas of the brain are stimulated all at once. There are different types of epileptic fits. For example, in a tonic-clonic seizure, also known as a grand mal epileptic attack, the abnormal ele electrical discharge will spread along the nerves to the muscles, causing the muscles all over the body to contract uncontrollably. It is often frightening for somebody to watch. So epilepsy, just like ADHD, is caused by an interruption in neurological flow in the brain. Dyslexia is a breakdown in perception where the symbols are reversed. Color blindness also involves a breakdown in perception. I will not mention anything about autism because I do not yet fully understand this disease, but it follows the same profile as epilepsy, ADHD, dyslexia and color blindness, and you deal with it in the same way. These disorders all involve a neurological breakdown, an interruption of thoughts, and various breakdowns in, in perception. There is a double-mindedness and confusion that comes in in these disorders. The Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We see in James 1 verse 8 that it says, For being as he is, a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, irresolute, he is unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything he thinks, feels and decides. For example, as I explained with ADHD, a child will start an activity, but then there's an interruption in the neurological flow in his thoughts, so he loses focus, and then he does whatever the next thing is that comes to mind. And so the child flips from one activity to another without finishing anything. Homosexuality also has something in common with ADHD and dyslexia. Now, I'm not saying that a person is at risk of becoming a homosexual because they have ADHD or dyslexia, but they do have the same common thread. Homosexuality also involves a type of double-mindedness and confusion, the primary root of the confusion being gender disorientation. In summary, epilepsy, ADHD, dyslexia, color blindness and homosexuality are different manifestations of the same underlying problem, which is a breakdown in perception and an interruption in neurological flow in the brain. And this is directly caused by a deaf and dumb spirit. This spirit is given access into families through ungodly order in the home, where the woman dominates and rules the household, while the man sits back passively in the background. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says, But I want you to know and realize that Christ is the head of every man, and the head of a woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. So we have the Father, and then we have Jesus, then the man, then the wife, and then the children. That is God's divine order. That brings the man into leadership as a husband which reflects the relationship that Christ has with the church as our husband. In Ephesians 5 verse 22 to 25 we read, Wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself the saviour of his body. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject in everything to their husbands, 
And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If the man is passive and does not rule the home in love, the woman has no choice but to take the reins. And the minute she does, Satan's entire kingdom comes to help her. When the woman wears the pants in the marriage relationship and she, she is the domineering ruler of the home and the man does not take his place as the spiritual head, you have an ungodly order and Satan has every legal right to come in with ADHD, dyslexia, homosexuality, color blindness, epilepsy and autism. These are diseases that specifically follow ungodly order in the home generationally. This is found to be the case every single time. In session 11, I explained the different types of brain waves. I spoke about theta brainwave activity, which enables you to comprehend thoughts, images and impressions between your soul and the spiritual realm, which includes your own human spirit, the Holy Spirit and any other evil spirit. Through theta brainwave activity, you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting you of truth, and you are also tempted by the devil and his kingdom. So anything that is spirit that would speak to you at the spirit level, you comprehend its voice, image, impression and thought through theta brainwave activity. I explained that this is the same pathway that is used in hypnosis and by the shamans who conjure up evil spirits with drum beats. Theta brain waves are four and a half beats per second, and that is why it is the rhythm of the drum beat used by the shaman to activate the pathway between the soul and the spirit so that evil spirits can gain access to the human soul through thought. I mentioned a study that was done on children who have been diagnosed with ADHD, which showed that they have increased theta brainwave activity. So even science is beginning to prove that not only the mind-body connection is real, but also the spirit-mind-body connection is real. Even the worldly psychiatrists have realized that there is something beyond the physical realm that is behind these diseases. But instead of what calling what they see spiritual, they are calling it energetics, and that is another deception. They don't know what is causing the theta brainwave activity to increase, so they are making up a theory about energetics. Well, we know what activates theta brainwave activity, and it's the same thing the shamans know when they conjure up devils with their drum beats. The Invisible Kingdom of Ephesians chapter 6. A seizure or convulsion can be caused by brain damage due to other underlying medical problems. For example, infections or abscesses in the brain, such as TB, toxoplasmosis or HIV. Convulsions can also be caused by a brain hemorrhage where there's bleeding into the brain that squashes and damages the nerves. Convulsions can be caused by strokes, trauma, tumors in the brain that squash and damage the nerves electrolyte imbalances in the blood, for example, low blood sugar, alcohol withdrawal, and certain medical drugs can all cause a convulsion or seizure. Strokes, infections, inflammation, and bleeding into the brain can be picked up by a doctor by doing a CT or MRI scan of the brain. Disturbances in electrolytes are picked up by doing blood tests. But many people with epilepsy have none of those medical conditions. There's no physical abnormality that can be found in, on brain scans or on blood tests. This is the type of epilepsy that I'm going to talk about. Epilepsy is a disease that is incurable in the medical field. All that has ever been achieved is disease management with anti-epileptic drugs. I said earlier that when a disease is incurable in the medical field, and we don't understand what causes it or how to treat it, I have learned to go to the Bible to look for the answer. How did Jesus minister to and heal people with epilepsy in the Bible? He cast out the deaf and dumb spirit. For example, in Mark chapter 9, 17 to 27, we read, And one of the throng replied to him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a dumb spirit. And whenever it lays a hold of him, so as to make it his own, it dashes him down and convulses him, and he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth, 
and he falls into a motionless stupor and is wasting away. This is a description of a grand mal epileptic seizure. And I asked your disciples to drive it out, and they were not able to do it. And he answered them, O unbelieving generation without any faith, how long shall I have to do with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. So they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, at once it completely convulsed the boy, and he fell to the ground and kept rolling about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has he had this? And he answered, From the time he was a little boy. So this may have been something that is genetically inherited. And it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water, intending to kill him. But if you can do anything, do have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said, You say to me, if I can do anything? Why, all things are possible to him who believes. At once the father of the boy gave an eager, piercing, and inarticulate cry with tears, and he said, Lord, I believe, but help me with the weakness of my faith. Isn't that honest? He said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and dumb spirit, I charge you to come out of him, and to never go into him again. And after giving a hoarse, clamoring, fear-stricken shriek of anguish, and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy lay pale and motionless like a, like a corpse, so that many of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took a strong grip of his hand and began lifting him up, and he stood. Another account of a man being healed of epilepsy through casting out an evil spirit is given in Mark 1 verse 23 to 27. Just at that time there was in their synagogues a man who was in the power of an unclean spirit. Now immediately he raised a deep and terrible cry from the depths of his throat, saying, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hush up and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing the man into convulsions and screeching with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all so amazed and almost terrified that they kept questioning and demanding of one another, What is this? What new, fresh teaching? Do you feel like that? Is this new, fresh teaching? With authority he gives orders even to unclean spirits, and they obey him. This is how Jesus dealt with epilepsy, and I intend to do the same thing, because how they are trying to treat epilepsy with drugs in the medical field is not working. You don't need medical drugs, you need deliverance. Here is a testimony of Pastor Henry Wright concerning how he dealt with a lady with epilepsy. They brought a young lady to me in 1985. She was about 21 years of age and had been experiencing grand mal epileptic seizures for many years. They heard that God was using this ministry, honoring our work, and people were being healed. They brought her to me. She was unsaved and she was living with her boyfriend in sin. She had had two abortions and I had to talk to her about these issues. She decided to accept the Lord as her saviour. I broke the power of the deaf and dumb spirit and cast it out of her and commanded the spirit of epilepsy to be gone. I didn't know if it had gone or not. I didn't see any visible evidence. I said goodbye. One week later she went to her doctor in Asheville, North Carolina. He ran an EEG test on her and her brainwave tests were all normal. The last time I heard about her, she was serving God internationally with, with youth with a mission. She is saved, healed, and now serving God. She never had another epileptic seizure ever again. That was the first of several encounters with people with epilepsy. So far, we have never lost a healing of epilepsy in the history of our ministry, although there is never a guarantee because everything is in God's hands by faith. For more than 15 years, Pastor Henry Wright has been ministering to people with epilepsy on this basis of casting out the deaf and dumb spirit. He claims that he has never seen a single failed healing 
from epilepsy. In the medical field, epilepsy has never once been cured with medical drugs. An EEG is a test that we do on the brain which can pick up abnormalities in the brain waves. That's theta brainwave activity, which we use to diagnose epilepsy. The healings of epilepsy that Henry Wright makes reference to have been documented through EEG tests in which the brain waves were normal. But 50% of people with epilepsy also have normal brain waves on EEG, so this in itself does not exclude epilepsy. But these people are also not on any medication and have never had another seizure. From a medical perspective, this confirms that they are healed of epilepsy. In order to get those healings, they had to cast out the evil spirit. So you may think that I have a screw loose up here, and you may laugh at me when I talk about certain diseases like ADHD, epilepsy, dyslexia and autism being the direct fruit of an evil spirit. But in reality, when these principles are put into practice, hundreds of people have been healed, and those healings have been documented medically. If you or your child has epilepsy, ADHD, autism, dyslexia or color blindness, to get well, you need to go before God with heartfelt repentance. If it is your marriage that involves the woman ruling the household, while the husband sits passively in the background, Repent and change your ways so that you are back in line with God's order and design for families. If the woman dominating the man involves the marriage of your parents or grandparents, repent for the sins of your fathers that gave entrance to the deaf and dumb spirit to come into the generations of your family tree and cause these diseases. Then with your God-given authority as a child of God, you need to say, on the authority of the name of Jesus, I break your power over me or my child, and I command you, deaf and dumb demonic spirit, to leave and be cast out in Jesus' name. Now, I don't suggest that you go and traumatize small children by casting out demonic spirits out of them. This is not necessary. Remember when I spoke about genetically inherited diseases in session 14, I mentioned 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14, which says that when parents repent and get right with God, their children are sanctified. With that background, I would now like to go into more detail about ADHD, because the amount of children being diagnosed with this problem is increasing at an alarming rate worldwide. Firstly, what is ADHD and how is it diagnosed? ADHD stands for Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder. There is no brain scan or blood test to diagnose ADHD. A doctor, psychologist or psychiatrist makes the diagnosis by getting a history of the child's behavior from the parents and teachers at the child's school. A form called the Connors Questionnaire is given to the parents and teachers to fill in. Basically, if a child's behavior fits the following criteria, ADHD is highly likely. If the child has six or more of the following symptoms indicating an inability to sustain attention. Can't sustain attention while performing a task and is easily distracted. Often starts a task in a rush but has difficulty in finishing it. Makes careless mistakes in schoolwork. Doesn't listen. For example, ignores the formality of a class or a teacher's social requests. Can't organize tasks. Avoids schoolwork. Loses things. Is forgetful. Then the child must have six or more of the following symptoms of hyperactivity or impulsivity. Fidgeting or squirming. Keeps leaving the seat in class. On the go. Runs around or climbs excessive, excessively or is ignorant of danger, cannot play quietly, silly noise making, talks excessively, blurts out answers, has difficulty in waiting for anything, and often interrupts or intrudes in the actions of others, is pleased to get negative attention, and is often the class clown. For the diagnosis to be made, the symptoms must have been present before the age of seven years, and the symptoms are often present by the age of three. The symptoms must be present in at least two settings, for example at school and at home. 
and the symptoms must cause impairment in academic functioning or social functioning. Children with ADHD often have emotional difficulties such as moodiness, depression and irritability. They often have a low frustration threshold, bad temper, are emotionally labile and have a poor self-image. About 75% of children with ADHD often show aggressive and defiant behaviour which is hostile and confrontational. Unfortunately, ADHD is being far too frequently and flippantly diagnosed by doctors who in a parrot-fashioned way prescribe Ritalin to any child who sort of fits the ADHD profile. Not every kid who displays some of the symptoms listed in the diagnostic criteria really does have ADHD. Often these symptoms are a result of stress and emotional turmoil. In session three, I spoke about stress and I explained there that children take 18 years for their brains to grow and fully mature. The stress that children experience is much greater than, that, than what we as adults experience. It is catastrophic to put it mildly. What we experience as moderate stress for children is catastrophic because the brain is still growing and in the developmental phase. It is very vulnerable and susceptible. When children are stressed, they cannot verbalize or express their emotions as well as we can, so it will come out in behavior problems. We are finding a lot of ADHD symptoms coming from classroom-induced stress or an unhappy home where, for example, the parents are continually in strife. Parents, you have no idea how you deeply affect your children when they see and hear you fighting. It instills deep emotional insecurity and fear inside of them. So before your children are diagnosed with ADHD, just take the time to sit with them and find out what their issues are. What is stressing them out? What is making them feel insecure and fearful? Children with ADHD symptoms coming from stress require a lot of love, time and attention from you as a parent. There's an old saying that children spell love like this, T-I-M-E. If you cut down your own busy schedule and invest more quality time than you usually do into your children to talk and bond with them and do various activities with them that they enjoy, you'll soon start seeing a significant change, for example, an improvement in their classroom performance. Dads, don't sit back and leave it to the mothers. You also have a very vital and instrumental role in the development of your children emotionally and especially spiritually, so be hands-on and get involved. The best way of dealing with stress in children is play and love. Let them play more and give them lots of love. So there are children who have symptoms of ADHD as a result of emotional stress and turmoil. And then there are children who genuinely have ADHD as a result of an interruption in the neurological flow, which leads to free-floating thoughts and impulsivity. Ritalin is the best known and most widely prescribed drug by doctors for the treatment of ADHD. Ritalin is a psychostimulant, which means that it goes into the brain and it stimulates the nerves. The best way that I can explain it is that it wakes the nerves up again so that the neurological flow is continued without being interrupted. This then elevates alertness and motivation. Some recreational drugs such as the amphetamine speed or ecstasy works by exactly the same mechanism. After the drug has worn off, the person feels even more despondent and demotivated. In the language of recreational drug users, speed is followed by a rebound crashing. And this rebound crashing can cause depression in a child with ADHD. It is true that 70% of children show some improvement in symptoms when they're on the drug Ritalin. However, as you know from session 10, it is also a very dangerous drug because there is a psychotic side effect that comes with this drug that is absolutely horrific. Ritalin has been one of the most widely researched drugs. One um, study by a national organization in America concerning children who are on Ritalin showed that 50% of them, at some time in their lifetime, end up breaking the law or in jail. 
And this has been directly related and attributed to the drug and not to ADHD. The statistics say that a child on Ritalin has a 50% chance of experiencing a psychotic side effect. You are playing a game of Russian roulette. Furthermore, because Ritalin is the chemical equivalent of the recreational drug speed or ecstasy, it is no wonder that more than 50% of children who take Ritalin end up becoming drug addicts. Psychiatrists treat the side effect of drugs with other drugs. The rebound depression is treated with antidepressants. The answer to the psychotic side effects is to prescribe another drug, an antipsychotic, which has terrible side effects of its own. So it's like opening a Pandora's box, and yet Ritalin is the current drug of choice for the treatment of ADHD. This drug is the shame of our doctors, parenting and school systems, because it is a lazy way out of the problem. There is an alternative method of dealing with ADHD, which is a technique called focusing. Focusing is a treatment at the secular level, but you will hardly ever hear about it because it is so much easier to just give your child Ritalin. It often does not appeal to parents and teachers because it takes a lot of cooperation, effort and patience on their part. In the hyperactive range of ADHD, the child is fine as long as he or she is concentrating on an object of interest. The neurological flow of focusing is normal. But when the child is not motivated, the neurological flow is interrupted, and the, then the child does whatever comes to mind. The focusing technique literally trains them to focus. This also involves a lot of loving discipline. I'm going to illustrate the focusing technique to you in the following true testimony, which was given by Pastor Henry Wright, who dealt with a child with ADHD. A child was brought to me. The child's school had said they needed a meeting with the parents because this child was so disruptive that he had to be placed at the back of the schoolroom in a chair with his face against the wall. He was totally isolated in a classroom and they still could not contain him. This particular child had straight Fs, an antisocial, disruptive, mouthy, rebellious, you name it behavior. When the parents got the letter, they came to me. It was obvious that the next step the school counsellors would recommend would be to put the child on the drug Ritalin. I went with the parents to the school counsellor to propose an alternative. The parents did not want the child on Ritalin because of its psychotic side effects and potentially dangerous implications. With the technique of focusing, we felt that this child's ADHD would be resolved and the school agreed to let us try it. We took this particular child and made up a chart. It had a row for every day of the week and every week of the month. We charted the next nine week period of the school semester. The chart had three columns. The first column had a smiling face. The next column had a, sm had a face with a straight line for the mouth. And the next column had a frowning face. I brought the child in and I said, this is the deal. If we can't help you through ministry and focusing, they are going to put you on Ritalin, which is a drug. I explained to the child the ramifications of the drug and the consequences. This is part of focusing, education. However, this is not threatening the child. Children understand when you take the time to talk to them. You may not think they do, but they really are listening, and you can reason with children if you take the time to meet with them on a level they can understand. We asked the child, if you could have anything today, what would you like? And he said, a Sega video game player. We told the child, for every day that you turn in your homework and you behave well in the classroom, the teacher is going to evaluate you. And if you succeed, she's going to put a smiling face in the column for that day. If you come home with a smiling face, your parents are going to give you two US dollars towards your goal to purchase the Sega. The day that you barely make it with a straight line on the face, you don't get any dollars. The day that you blow it and you really blow it and get a frowning face, you will lose one dollar from one of the days where you got a smiling face. At the end of the nine week period, 
If you have more smiling faces than you have straight lines and frowning faces, then you will receive your prize. The alternative you do, if you don't is Ritalin, because the school will require it. This is your choice. And that's where we began. For the first two weeks, it was kind of rough. Remember that we are establishing new boundaries, new focusing, new concepts, and that takes time, patience and effort. But then things started to shift. I'm here to tell you that with ministry and focusing, in conjunction with the teacher's cooperation, as well as the child and the parents, this works. In the second nine week period, the child went from F's to the AB on a roll. The third nine week period, the child maintained a position on the AB on a roll. And by the fourth grade period, the child was still on the AB on a roll. He became the student of the year and for the last nine weeks was the teacher's assistant. He went from the back of the room to the front of the room, all through focusing prayer and ministry, and we didn't have to go to drugs. This is significant, and this is a more excellent way. That's not the rest of the story. He felt so good about himself and was so proud when he walked up to the front of that assembly at the end of the school year and got the cert certificate for the student of the year. That something wonderful happened on inside of him and he never let go of his achievements. Part of the profile of ADHD is self-rejection. So this young man started to be a winner and he liked being a winner. He did not want to rebel anymore. He liked being the teacher's pet. Suddenly a new life had begun and he knew he wasn't on drugs and didn't need to be on drugs and that was very important to him. The second year came up and they brought him to me again and I said, okay, you know how we won this battle last year. This year there'll be no reward. You only get one Sega in a lifetime. You know how God met you and you know how you came through with flying colors last year. This year, do you think you can make it through just by focusing and observing how you feel about yourself? And he said, Pastor, I think I can do it. I might blow it every now and then though. And Henry said, well, I blew it yesterday myself. In summary, ADHD involves a breakdown in neurological flow in the brain that interrupts a child's thoughts, making it difficult to focus and causing them to shift attention from one thing to another. ADHD is caused by a deaf and dumb spirit, and this demonic spirit was given an entrance point by a marriage where the woman dominated and ruled the household. She wore the pants while the man sat back passively in the background. The deaf and dumb spirit, along with ADHD, as well as epilepsy, dyslexia, color blindness and autism, which are also um, caused by this demonic spirit, can run in families and thus can be inherited. Because the demonic deaf and dumb spirit is behind ADHD, repentance and deliverance is necessary for healing. Now when you cast out the deaf and dumb spirit, you may not see anything different. There is going to be no lightning bolt from heaven. You have just got to know in faith that the power of the spirit is broken, because it is, and I know this from experience. When you step out in faith and use your God-given authority to cast out the spirit, it has no choice but to leave. The neurological flow in your child's brain will be restored back to normal instantly. Your child will no longer experience an interruption of thoughts that makes it difficult to concentrate. However, you must understand that the child has learned habits and mindsets which take time to change, and this doesn't happen overnight. And this is where focusing comes in. This is where much patience and effort by the parents is needed. This is where the parents need to rearrange their busy schedules and purposefully invest quality time with the child. The bi biblical principle behind this is Proverbs 22 verse 6, which says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. ADHD has a low self-esteem, self-hatred, and self-rejection attached to it. And this is exacerbated by the fact that the child often had problems with learning and may have been the bottom of the class at school. 
It is very discouraging and a huge knock to your self-esteem when you are always getting straight Fs. So you need to actively help the child to develop a healthy self-esteem. Praise them at every possible opportunity. Make a big deal out of their little victories and celebrate with them as they progress and improve. However, be careful that they don't get the idea that they are loved on, on the basis of performance. In session 17, I have a teaching for adults to help them develop a healthy self-esteem. And this starts with knowing who you are in Christ and learning to see yourself as God sees you. You need to find a way to teach your children on a level that they understand about their incredible value and self-worth. Here is the testimony of one lady who is a close family friend. She had a daughter who had a severe case of ADHD. I explained to her the principles that I have shared with you in this session and she put them into practice. Here is their story. Works for everyone, but it has worked for me and it has worked for my family. 
I'm blessed to have a wonderful husband who believes in God and she loves our family. He was so amazing as we prayed to cast out the devil and the spirit and the sins of our ancestors with little trauma, with as little trauma to our children as possible. We actually prayed over them and then when the children went to the next year we prayed for the prayer which can be a little bit of God and the children to hear things like that. And she's she's only nine so she I then started with a spa chart, uh, which Michelle mentioned, and we embarked on a nine week course of trying to break the habits, as we believe that God keeps His word and He heals her. So it was now just a case of breaking the bad habits that have formed over the years. This focusing method helps them to focus on something which gives them a goal to get through some very hard weeks ahead. It was not easy. I believe that there is still healing happening in her life, and we take it one day at a time. The self esteem is quite low, but um, as Michelle and I were talking earlier on, it does take a little while to get through. And you also don't understand the last four children. Um, it is not easy for any of us, but we know that in the long run, it is the best thing for her. We took a leap of faith, and we decided to stop her return after praying for her that day. It was at least six weeks of withdrawal symptoms, mood swings, headaches, and agitation. My heart ached at seeing the withdrawals and the, the results of what the delivery had done. I worked closely with her teacher, who was who has been wonderful and very really understanding. I praise God today for the work that he has done in my little girl. Yes, you might have dropped a little. But she is interacting in class now. <coughs> she is laughing and joking, and being the child that God wants her to be. Life is quite the whole mouse that comes to school for Mrs. to do her homework, I mean, since to do work in class. We never spoke to anybody or interacted even with her teacher. And I checked up with her teacher last week, and she said she was not little much, she just sat there, did what she was supposed to have done, but didn't, didn't interact in class. She remarked her wonderful bit. That's not what I believe God does. There are times when the devil is trying to put the doubt in our lives that she is not healed and that her low esteem, her low self esteem is what we've done to her. But we have, but we stand today strong in our faith that our precious father has come back the life of the little baby girl. I want to thank God for caring enough about us to heal us. I want to thank Michelle for having enough faith in God. She is finished.